Welcome to the Australian Water School, the home of demand-driven industry design training for the global water sector. Hello and welcome to today's Australian Water School webinar covering the development of rating curves from measurements and models. I'm your host, Cray Price. Thrilled to be with you today from those attending all around the world, watching at all hours of the night in some cases. Welcome to all of the attendees. There's been a tremendous response to this topic and uh, we hope we can do uh, bring you more of this kind of content going forward. So welcome to everybody joining us. So um, with no further ado, I want to introduce the experts for today. John, Bob and Kyle, if you want to turn on your cameras and join us here, you can read about a little bit about their backgrounds here. There are more extensive background uh, content available on the uh, registration page that you may have seen, but I'm thrilled to be joined by John, Bob, and Kyle today who will help guide some of the discussion and answer some of your Q&A questions. If you want to pull up the poll results here, who is attending um, as typical for these um, sessions, commercial and consulting has uh, ruled, um, is, uh, is on top. Engineering is the specialty discipline where most people are coming from. Uh, a lot of hydrologic and hydraulic modelers, but the uh, what, what I wanted, what I was very interested in seeing here, and I'd be, be curious if we asked this question 20 years ago, would it have been different? You know, have you measured stream flow in the field? We've got half of the attendees have been out in the field measuring stream flow, and half have not. We have more than half, if you consider um, the next question, who have uh, developed a rating curve, some from measurements, some from model results, hopefully some from both, but about a third of the attendees have never developed a rating curve uh, at all. So welcome uh, for those who are beginners to this uh, topic. We welcome all backgrounds here and want to make sure that we provide some uh, relevant content for the wide ranging background that we've got. So let's have first an introduction maybe from Kyle, if you want to say good day and tell us where you're coming to us from. And um, I think we had a brief discussion about uh, some of the ways that you've measured uh, flow or estimated flow rates in the past, if you want to share that with us, Kyle. Yep, I'm uh, here at Water Modeling Solutions. Uh, my background's more infrastructure, you know, pits and pipes and a bit of mining stuff, big exciting projects, I guess. It's pretty interesting. I was sharing the story of Cray and the others that um, anecdotal evidence is often just as important as what you can measure out in the field. There's a lot of uncertainty in what we do. So in a past life, I was working for an industrial client and Anecdotally, one of the guys on site said he had this uh, this ute that was pushed this far across across the site, and you know the water depth was around to his um, his knees, so we could pull up a hazard plot and work out quickly that was the depth, roughly speaking. This is the velocity and the stream power we needed to push it this far, and yeah, we ended up getting a pretty good calibration, all things considered, from that. So, you, yeah, you take what you can get for the data. Yeah. So that's one way of uh, yeah using anecdotal uh, um, information for a per, kind of a forensic analysis. Yeah. Um, it's better Bob, than nothing. <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> that, that's great. Um, uh, Bob, uh, tell us where you're coming to us from today. And maybe uh, if you want to introduce to us, uh, I, I'll let you introduce John and tell us how you met John the first time. Maybe how about <laughs> that? <laughs> okay. Well, I, I'm coming from Melbourne, Australia, and my background is in hydraulic engineering in various forms. Uh, John and I met a long, long time ago. In fact, I don't know whether John will remember this, but it was at a conference in New Zealand where uh, I was giving a presentation on physical modelling and uh, someone in the audience uh, stood up and, and said, why didn't you do it using mathematical modelling? And um, I said, well, I didn't, because at the time, mathematical modeling was, a, was, uh, was in its, its, its birth, really, in terms of uh, highly accurate measurement of, uh, or prediction of turbulence and so on. And I said, that's why. And he said, oh, 19th century hydraulics and stalked out of the room. And uh, John came up to me afterwards and said, that was so unfair. And that's how I met John, was oh. at that conference. So we shared that. We shared a drink afterwards, in fact, more than one drink. And uh, we worked together at Monash University uh, back in the uh, about 20 years ago and had a great collaboration there. And uh, John went on to uh, uh, move around the world and I stayed here and uh, we kept in touch slightly in the meantime. And it's just so good to see and to be paneling with him again. It's a great <laughs> experience for me. 
Excellent. John, if you want to say good day and tell us uh, where you're joining us from. Yes, I'm joining from Vienna in Austria uh, with a um, compulsory bust of Mozart behind me, uh, very tastefully painted by the people from the, the opera in Berlin. Uh, anyway, uh, so i am i am been working in Austria now for 10 years uh, and... Uh, uh, when I say working, uh, it's more of a hobby than work, uh, and because uh, I'm continuing to do my research, enjoying it, occasionally teach, and generally uh, having fun with hydraulics. Excellent. Well, thanks for sharing that. Um, we'll hear from all of our panelists um, at, at the conclusion of this session. Again, keep the questions coming through the Q&A line. Um, what I'm going to do first is just introduce the concept of rating curves. Um, it will be fairly introductory. Um, uh, and then John's going to show you a few details. But just to set the stage for this, um, this can get very, very complex. It sounds simple to begin with, but it gets very, very complex. And so what we're going to ask you at the end of this is, do you want to see more of this? Do you want to dive into these details? Um, and when, if you do, um, we will have some workshops, maybe a couple of two-hour uh, two sessions where you can get together with the presenters, run the programs that John will introduce to you today, and develop your own rating curve from data and from models, both, so from the measurements and from the models, and then check them against each other and see. Um, everybody's going to get different answers. This is not an exact science. And so if you want more of that, fill out that poll question uh, in the end and, uh, and let us know. So we'll give you a little bit of a teaser here on what might come. Um, and uh, but, but again, when we do that workshop, we're going to have this <laughs> webinar be required watching um, to introduce the topic. So I may start out very basic, and then we'll get into some of the more advanced topics. And if you want to dive into more details, uh, do join us for some of the workshops that will be coming later on. So with that, um, again, let me just uh, introduce the concept of a rating curve here. And when we look at a rating curve, um, some of you have seen something like this that um, look fairly simple. And essentially, if you've got a stage gauge out there and you're able to measure the stage uh, going up and coming back down again, um, it's nice if it follows uh, a nice smooth line. But that's not uh, typical. That's not always the case. Um, hang on, let me just annotate my screen here with a spotlight so that you can see this um, as I'm highlighting this. When we go through here then and look at this science, why is there a whole science called hydrography? We put that question in the polls uh, earlier to see how many hydrographers there were. And uh, not a lot responded yes, but there is a whole science of hydrography out there um, that involves a much bigger picture than what we're covering today. So oceans and seas and coastal areas we're going to be focusing on rivers and not just how the rivers change over time, but how the water changes over time, water levels, the flows. Um, that's the piece of hydrography that we're covering today. And um, you can read more about this. Hydro.gov.au will tell you a little more about this science. Now, looking at the USGS's website on how stream flow is measured, you can see um, how it used to be measured and in some cases still is measured that way. But in the future, you know, there may be some other ways coming that uh, will help us out. If you look at the rising bubble concept, for example, if you let a bubble, uh, release a bubble from the bottom uh, and let it rise up to the surface and time it, um, it's gonna take advantage of the full profile to give you an average um, for what that velocity might be. Another interesting concept that is being used quite frequently now is uh, large-scale uh, particle image velocimetry. I don't even know if I'm saying that correctly, but uh, that's something where you can get a drone up and video, you know, take a video and uh, look at what's happening on the surface and try and take that and turn that into flow measurements. Another way is in boats. And uh, this is Ray Maynard's uh, site. We'll give you some uh, links to his presentations, which uh, again, in Australia, picture this as the Fitzroy River here going back and forth across this, uh, this section of the river. It's hard to keep a boat along a section where you might have measured bathymetry or um, hydrography, really hydrographic surveys. And if you're trying to measure velocities going all the way down through the water column, you know, the directions that, uh, that, that those velocities are coming from makes a big difference. And then when, when you're in Australia, have a look down here. Um, maybe Ray's got some stories he might share with you. If you, we, We'll try and get him on doing a presentation one of these days for bull sharks and crocodiles. So have a look at that. Another thing uh, that, uh, you know, that is used quite frequently around the world, um, these cableways, you can go in and that keeps you out of the water. It keeps you right along an exact section. Um, you know, maybe some safety issues there potentially. Uh, but look at what's going on now with some drones. Um, you can actually get drones up in the air as well and uh, have them pull the uh, gadgets back and forth. That might be a little safer. Uh, keep in mind, 
find though that when we take these things back and do some post-processing, there may be some errors that are introduced. Um, you know, computers don't make errors, but human errors get introduced in the computer uh, routines that we might write. For example, look at uh, these folks here measuring stream flows. Um, if I do a little post-processing on this and right-click on these images in PowerPoint, look at what I get. PowerPoint has done a little assessment for me here, and it tells me this is a person riding an elephant in the water. This is a red fire hydrant covered, uh, surrounded by snow. So again, I just present those a little anecdotally just to show that um, you know our methods are not perfect. Um, they they come with some interpretation and some extrapolation that's not necessarily going to be correct. And in this case, the story of the elephant uh, and the mouse, uh, you know, or the the elephant and the blind the blind man touching the elephant, you know, that's what we've got here. Sometimes you're touching one one piece of this curve, how do you figure out what the rest of it looks like? And that smooth curve I showed going up and back down in the beginning, that's not always reality. You have this hysteresis, the looping effect sometimes. Um, here's one from Portland, uh, Oregon, my, my old hometown. Think about some of these data points that are tidally influenced. You know, we're 100 Ks from uh, the uh, ocean outlet there in Portland, but still, if you get some high levels at high tides, Technically, if you had low tide at the same time, you would be out here um, with discharges that are three or four times the discharge that you would have estimated if you're looking at these tidal levels. Also, the 1D versus 2D extrapolations can be very different. Um, this one's from the Fitzroy River as well. Um, watch out. These, uh, these are some concepts that we wanted to, uh, to red flag here for you today. So here's a, a data set that I just pulled last week, just trying to look at a uh, stream gauge that um, I was trying to extract some data from, and we stopped an initial study here and now there's extra data and I thought oh awesome let's go see if there's been some higher flows now uh, for everybody online um, in, in a real course we would uh, have a quiz question here and say what's wrong with this what's wrong with this data what's going on here and so have a look here and see if anything would jump out to you um, if you were assessing level and discharge these two charts come up side by side along the same time axis here what's going on if I tried to find the highest level that's ever been recorded at this gauge since it was installed back in 2003, it would have happened this year, uh, last year in 2020. But look at the flow down here. The flow that is computed uh, based on the rating curve is way down here. Well, the actual highest discharge that was shown here corresponds in 2008 uh, to a lower level that's been exceeded a couple of times since then. So you can tell already just by looking at this, the stage versus discharge relationship is not constant. There must be something else going on. So let's have a look in plan view. Again, this is um, extracting data from a hydraulic model, not from measurements. So we talked a little bit about measurements. John will get into that in a few minutes here. But um, this is extracting uh, model results uh, you know, from an actual hydraulic model, in this case, a 2D model where we have flow going downstream and we're going to measure flow across a cross section. Um, this, could be, this could be one of your index lines that you use in any hydraulic modeling software. We want to extract, extract the uh, flow rates over time. If I want to, if say I put in a gauge here, right at that point, I want to extract a time series stage hydrograph at that point. So the flow, the flux has to go across a section line and the uh, stage has to be measured at a point. Well, in a 1D model, this would have been an exact flat water surface elevation, not because it is so in nature, but because that's how you drew it in your 1D model. That's one of the limitations of a 1D model. So your stage hydrograph, the top of the water surface, would be the same anywhere you go. So you want to go to the lowest part of the channel, but it wouldn't change over time. In reality, in a 2D model, I've got this floodplain over here. I've got the deep section of the channel. The water surface elevation could vary. You've got rougher terrain up here that's slowing it down. And so when I put in my gauge, I may be measuring it right there at the gauge, but if I measured somewhere else along that section, I might be getting a different level. And where I put this can be influenced by different factors as well. If I'm too near a confluence, that will affect things. If I'm too near a structure, that will affect things. In this case, I've got three of them that I'm modeling here, and I'm just going to extract three sets of hydrographs. There's attenuation on the way downstream. And then I take those flow hydrographs, I plot them against a elevation curve. And obviously, the upstream one is higher than the downstream ones. And when I put all three of them together, you do see some looping there. I've got three different flows at the peak, um, and then I've got different um, rating curves on the way up as on the way down. And how do we do that? Well, if you extract from a point, the stage, and across a cross section, the discharge, if I just put this into Excel, and I'm just showing a few time steps here, plot time against discharge, I've got time on the axis down below, discharge uh, on the vertical axis, and that's a flow hydrograph. 
time series. Now, if I take the time and plot it against stage, I get the same time step down here, the same uh, time uh, axis, and I've got stage now as my axis going up and down. Then if I want to take time out of it, and I just plot discharge against stage, now I've got my rating curve, no time anymore. So again, time against discharge is your flow hydrograph, time against stage is your stage hydrograph, and then discharge against stage without time in it is the rating curve. So I take my flow hydrograph, I can add it together with my stage hydrograph and put it into the same plot where on the uh, one axis, vertical axis, I've got discharge. On the other vertical axis, my secondary axis, um, I've got the stage. So I can put these on the same plot. Then if I take that flow and stage hydrograph and subtract time, so I'm getting rid of this axis and now I'm plotting discharge against stage, that's my rating curve. And again, many of you understand this concept already, but it sounds like um, at least a third have never even developed a rating curve. So I wanna make sure we've highlighted this. So on a flow and stage hydrograph, if you see these plotted out next to each other together, uh, I do wanna make sure that this concept is clear that when you're looking at uh, time as an, uh, on the axis here and time is moving on, your discharge goes up and down. And then we look over here to the right at the secondary axis, my stage goes up and down, but they vary differently. Um, and if you are in a perfect system where you don't have any looping, no hysteresis, it comes up and back down along the same line. And I want to plot this. This is from one of the um, HECRAS uh, examples that ships with the software. And I'm just extracting a curve from that software and just pulling it straight out of one of the uh, time steps here um, or one of, one of the uh, bridge locations. As I come across here on the time axis, what happens when you have no hysteresis is that as you come across here with time and you get to a uh, given um, flow rate um, out here um, and at a given stage on the way up, if you have no looping, as it comes up and comes back down, you get to that same uh, stage over here, and that stage corresponds at this time step to a given flow, and it's exactly the same flow as it was on the way up. So this line here and this line here um, form a perfect box, same at any of these intervals, no looping. And so essentially, again, what we've done, this is stage, this is flow. We've taken this flow and flipped it on its side. So you can see it right here. We've just taken this axis right there. And that axis is now being made horizontal on our uh, stage versus discharge curve. Instead of stage versus time, we have stage versus discharge. All we're doing is taking this axis and flipping it on its side. Now we have a rating curve, same on the way up as on the way down. But in reality, these are sometimes looped. The way up is different than the way down because your energy gradient has sometimes changed. So I want to show at least one example of this um, concept. As time moves on, say I take uh, my, my point of concern is at an elevation here, in this case of 313.5. So I'm standing there with a gauge and I want to know how much flow is going across my cross section uh, when I hit an elevation of 313.5. So as time moves on, and I get to a time step of three hours. At three hours, I've now hit that stage. Well, when I've hit that stage and I come down here, I've got an equivalent flow that's 24 cubic meters per second. So at this point in time, I've got a stage and a flow. Now the flood comes and it comes uh, and it peaks and it comes back down. Now I've hit the same stage. When I hit this stage here and I come down, to the flow hydrograph at that same instant in time. This is one instant in time where we have stage and flow together. That flow is now different, it's 20. So as I bring that same stage across here to my rating curve, I will hit that rating curve on the way up at a discharge of 24. And when I come up and peak and come back down again, now I'm down at 20. Which of these is correct? Or is the real answer somewhere in between? or is the real answer somewhere else? That's what we wanted to make sure we introduce that, uh, that uncertainty today, because there is a lot of uncertainty in these things. And I'll show a couple of different concepts on things that can affect it. That downstream piece um, at the confluence that I showed you earlier on the map, um, there's actually a negative hydrograph there. A negative hydrograph is not wrong. That much just means the way you've oriented it. You've got flow coming into the page rather than out of the page on the section. Um, it's just reverse oriented. So down here, you've got negative flows because you're in a backwater area where the flow has gone uh, the other way. And uh, what that looks like when I then plot that against the stage hydrograph and put stage and flow together, I end up with some points, data points out here that are in the negative. 
Okay, is that correct? Well, yeah, but you probably don't want to put your rating curve there. You probably want to get, or your gauge station there. You probably want to move it somewhere where you're not going to be influenced by some of these other factors. But that'll happen in tidal areas and other places like that as well. Another thing I wanted to talk about is the sensitivity to roughness. Um, I did nothing in this model other than adjust the roughness. Okay, so I've got, um, and, and, and that has affected uh, the, the discharge in this case because I've got, uh, this is a, happens to be a, like a rain on grid model where I've got some flow that's being uh, backed up because it's rougher. But when I take this flow and I take the stage along with it, um, I've get different results by varying things within a reasonable range. So I think this was like 0.05, this might be 0.03 and 0.07. So these are all reasonable ranges for roughness. You don't know, it could vary seasonally by the vegetation or if it got burned out, uh, something like that. You may have roughness varying that much. Now have a look here when I put it together in a rating curve. Within that reasonable range of roughness coefficients, at a stage in this case of 314.5, if I wanted to know when I'm measuring 314.5 with my tele telemetric uh, system or whatever I've got out there, if I just spot eyeballed it um, and measured that flow, that uh, height on the water, some of your models, your model might tell you you've got 12 cubic meters a second. Another one might tell you you got 45. You know, that's over three or four times as much flow right there. A factor of three to four uh, can happen within a reasonable range of roughness coefficients. So be very careful. Why does some of this happen? Um, and this is again from Ray Maynard's paper that we'll give you some links to in, uh, in, a, in a few minutes here. Um, sometimes I like to plot the cross section against the stage uh, hydrographs as well, or the, the, um, uh, the rating curves. In this case, uh, he's plotted hydraulic radius here. Have a look at what happens. Now the hydraulic radius, if you look at Manning's equation, you know, your slope may be all over the place. Um, you don't know necessarily know the energy gradient um, and that can differ in the rising limb versus the falling limb. So there is some uncertainty there as well. Um, the area is not so uncertain. If you've surveyed this, um, the roughness has got some uncertainty. You don't know that, but look at how the hydraulic radius changes as your elevations come up. So as your elevation comes up across this point, all of a sudden there's a little bit of a dip in it. And up at this point, same thing, there's a bit of a dip in it. And why is that? Well, the radius, you can't really define it as, um, as an average depth, but on really long channels, like some of the really big systems, um, it might be the equivalent of an average depth. And think about what happens to the average depth here. The average depth across this floodplain right here is fairly high. And then once you pass this point, and now it floods and spills into the next section of this river, all of a sudden your hydraulic radius, boom, has dropped down and comes back up. That relationship between Q and, uh, and H in this case is going to change. And no matter where you are, in most of the systems we're looking at with structures, you're going to have Q equals VA. So I've got Q equals VA up here, Q equals VA there, Q equals VA there, Q equals VA there. Anywhere you go, the discharge is going to be equal to the velocity times the area. So your discharge is the same through here, unless, you know, you've got a lot of storage going on. Essentially, you've got steady flow conditions on something this short. So you've got the same inflow as outflow. You're not storing any more water here, but it is doing some pretty interesting things. Your models, your 1D and 2D models are going to depth average this here. But again, if you're trying to rate your Q and you start out with a small Q and come up to a higher Q and come back down, that Q is going to be the same everywhere. But your H, your depth and your height and whatever you're going to be measuring that against, could be different um, throughout this, uh, this section of river here. And that's one of the things we want to look out for, especially around a structure. And um, to conclude with here, I just wanted to show a couple of things about structures. If you look at this, this is for a, uh, a given bridge. You can see the BR here. This is a grass model with, uh, with bridge deck. And you can see how some things change very quickly when the flow hits the bridge deck. But I want to make sure that everybody understands the concept of a tailwater curve. Why do we have points out here and we don't have points out here. And could you ever get points out in this area? And what happens, what has to happen for you to get a point right here where you have zero flow? Well, if you imagine some of these uh, bridge profiles, for example, and this is from a USGS paper here, um, showing what happens with orifice flow uh, down through the bottom of it and weir flow over the top. If you are measuring um, a, the H basically, um, and, and you, you look at your water surface elevation um, and you're measuring that against discharge, you can have a completely backwatered system. Say it's tidal down here, or you get some obstruction. You can have still water and that's going to give you zero flow at a given stage. So you can have still water at a given H, just because you have a given H doesn't mean you have flow. 
but there is a maximum amount of flow that you can get in free flow conditions. That maximum amount of flow though, if you're measuring your H somewhere else, like say you measure the H or the, your, your stage at the outflow of this little orifice right here. Well, if you're measuring how much is coming out here and your orifice equation, say your C doesn't change and your A doesn't change and gravity doesn't change and you've got this H, say you load this up with a kilometer deep column of water, that H, you know, the water surface right here has not changed, but your discharge rates and your velocities have changed tremendously. And theoretically it's infinite. You could go all the way up and shoot more and more water through here without changing the elevation of the water surface that you may be measuring. So watch out where you take your stages, where you're measuring um, these flows. And um, as Kyle mentioned, you know, some of these things um, may, may be different. You know, you might have uh, run into some cars or some vehicles or something along the way. There can be things that affect uh, your flow rates. Um, going back to the old school on a structure, say a culvert right here, this is also a rating curve. And the way we used to do it, you would plot a line that gives you your culvert geometry. And from there, you use that as a pivot point. And now your H versus Q is essentially a rating curve. And so when you do this right here, you can rotate and you can see how the H and the Q are related to each other based on this nomograph. So people have known about these rating curves for a long time. What uh, has changed a bit is that a lot of people now are doing more unsteady modeling than steady flow modeling. At a steady flow rate, which you know a lot of rating curves out there are based on 1D steady flow models. And again, if the area under a curve, under a hydrograph, if you integrate that and that becomes the volume of flow, look at the difference in the volume of flow from the steady high flow. This is infinite. It keeps going forever and ever. It's infinite volume available to you. Whereas in a real unsteady flow hydrograph, you don't have that available to you. And that can affect things as the storages are filling, whether these storages are real or not, in a 2D model with some you know, uh, really coarse um, terrain surfaces, you might be filling artificial surfaces. And so you gotta watch out for that. Sometimes we need to let it hit steady flow conditions. And I'll do this sometimes with my models. Um, if I've got a simulation time of you know, 14 days, um, I don't wanna run my model for 14 days to watch that flood come and go. I'll shorten that way down and keep it at some given flow rate until it reaches steady flow. And I'll take a, a stage volume or a stage discharge uh, point here and here and here after it reaches steady flow conditions to save myself some modeling time. Um, one, one thing you can tell now in 2D models, um, sometimes you can do a preliminary 2D model and determine where you wanna put your uh, gauge and where you might uh, wanna even float your boat across to take flow measurements. Cause you don't wanna be up in here where it's circulating around. You know, try to get into uh, uniform areas. Now with that, I do want to turn over for, again, a, a, a little overview of what uh, John has available to you uh, for our workshops. Um, but uh, first, let me just show you here this paper by Tony Ladson. Um, this is a blog, um, look up this address. Um, I haven't re reprinted each of these uh, on my own website, but on surfacewater.biz slash rating, um, you can get to uh, a bunch of articles about rating curves um, and it'll show you the theory behind these. I'll put some more resources there as well. But I think Tony's got an awesome set of resources here, including um, John Fenton's papers. And uh, but I think one that's not on here yet because it's very recent um, is this one right here that we'll have him talk about a little bit. And then Bob and John together have done a paper that um, that I do link to on my website as well, uh, and that Tony does as well. Um, that's got some background on calculation of stream flow from measurements of stage. And um, those resources on Tony's website also link to uh, Ray's um, presentation about uh, collecting stream gauge information in Australia. So with that, I see, John, you've come on. Um, I, I haven't really looked at the Q&A line. Kyle, was there anything that you saw that was upvoted that, um, that you wanted to hit briefly? Oh, it's maybe one for the group, but Andrew Brown was asking about what solutions are available when you want to undertake gauging in remote areas, creeks and rivers with imperial streams that only experience things like flash flooding and run dry. It's a tricky one. I think um, there are gauging options. They are quite expensive for dry creek beds. So probably reach out to a manufacturer or a supplier. Yeah, very difficult to answer. <laughs> yeah, it's going to vary. And, and, but, but new technology, the, the vendors yeah. are incredible at this. They're going to come up with new solutions every time um, that are going to improve safety and data reliability. So yeah, do, maybe we'll put some links to some of the for vendor the, sites um, as well. For the dry ones, they're often more expensive. Um, the wet running gauges... If they're always turning on and off, then they don't blow out as quickly. So the dry ones, um, the gauges tend not to work when you need them to. So it's worthwhile spending a little bit of extra money 
to get a good product. Yeah, excellent. Okay, well, with that, um, let's just turn over to John then. Um, John, if you could give an overview, um, again, of what uh, what you might be covering in a workshop, and then we'll open it up to a Q&A. So over to you. Yes, good morning. Well, I want to talk about data approximation. It's a, a fairly narrow approach, but I think we can see how interesting it is. And so on the screen, we have a typical problem from a river in Australia. We have a number of points. And the problem is we want to approximate. And so this is the sort of result we can get. But it's the sort of result that is actually more difficult than one might expect. So as I've said at the bottom, it doesn't look like rocket science, but to get this very simple looking result, there are problems to overcome. Now let's look at the traditional view of rating curve approximation. We have this very old familiar function here where the discharge is proportional to uh, a a height, a stage, relative stage to some power. That's very familiar. The trouble is it's too simple. It only has three parameters and is limited in its accuracy and generality despite what all textbooks and university lecture notes might say. On the other hand, it's too complicated, such that the three parameters occur non-linearly. The parameter here multiplying another parameter inside an exponent. And the upshot is that visual and manual methods are often used very, very old fashioned. So what we want to do is to automate and generalize the operation of rating curve approximation. So we're going to use least squares approximation. Here is a a typical scenario where we're going to try and pass some approximating function through a cloud of points, trying to minimize the errors that we can see written there. And so there are various problems. The first problem is uh, there is a rapid variation of discharge with H at small discharges. So where we have local control, uh, we have something that actually does look like the power function. And depending where we have, uh, might even have uh, channel control, we also get this power function. However, if we rewrite that by taking discharge to the power nu as one on mu, we get a linear function in stage, in its linear, in the parameters, and is a good approximation. And we've taken the curvature into the q to the new term. And so Bob Keller and I in in 2001 suggested a simple generalization that one can use a polynomial of degree M extensively, but we approximate this Q to the new. And so we recommended a value of new as a half. It's a mean value from hydraulic discharge formulae and both from weirs and channel cross sections. And it it sounds rough, but it's not if we're in the business of approximation. And we calculated and presented one result where it worked well. Next problem is in rating curves to approximation, the range of discharge is huge, where discharge can vary by a factor of 10,000 between, for example, between Q is one to 10, 10,000 cubic meters per second. And of course, if one uses this uh, somewhat quaint Australian unit in the water industry of megaliters per day, we multiply that by 86.4. And if we use this equally quaint unit here, uh, we have to multiply by 35. So we get very large numbers. The good news is we have already solved the problem by using Q to the power nu with nu as a half, because we only have to approximate over a range of one to a hundred. 
Now, polynomials, however, in stage can have huge problems. The previous ones were almost obvious and the solution almost obvious. The next problem is more subtle but can be much more serious, and it's this. And here we're, I'm trying to, if we were to represent a rating curve, and here I've turned it around, so we're plotting here H horizontally, and let us say we were using uh, actual elevation. We're up at 100 metres up in the hills, and we have a 10 metre range. Uh, and let's look at the individual components here, H to the power 2 and so on, and we find that in this range they're almost all straight lines. And so consider then the problem of approximating a rating curve with a finite curvature. And the coefficients in our approximation would have to work very hard, being large and oscillating in sign. And uh, this can often happen. For example, in Germany, uh, rating curve stages are often specified in centimetre. And so we get numbers like this and problems like this, where, which can occur when we don't expect it. There is a solution, and it's this. And it's to use Chebyshev polynomials, where we can see now, rather than three near straight lines, the first 15 Chebyshev polynomials the, the first five shown in black all look very different from everyone else, and so they can approximate almost anything efficiently. Another problem, the least squares equations are badly conditioned. This means that the equations all look much the same as each other. And so our problem is that we want to solve to minimize the mean square error by solving for our coefficients. And if we do that using traditional least squares methods, the equations are very badly conditioned. They all look like each other. So it's a little bit of a, a metaphor here, like society. Diversity is good. Diversity in functions and diversity in equations is good. Our solution here, however, is to use optimization methods searching for a minimum in M plus one space and package software works well. Next question, how many terms to include in the polynomial? And with increasing number of terms, sooner or later, the degree of approximation becomes too high and unacceptable oscillations appear. And so we can see here with this particular curve that uh, using, using a quadratic function has approximated the points really quite well, which is remarkable. As Bob Keller and I know, the geometry is really rather complicated. If we increase at, by four and five degree polynomial, results in near coincidence, and at six, though, things go badly wrong, and at seven, it's a complete catastrophe. So we have to know when to stop. So let's consider the experience with these meth methods. In a couple of papers that I've written, we implemented all the above steps with quite satisfactory results. And then a couple of colleagues of mine from Melbourne then uh, looked at 622 overachievers, rating curves from a number of reference stations. They found that the above methods worked well with the exception of about half a percent of the stations. So for the development of a standalone computer program, the problems of occasional unusual low flow data and automatically determining the level of approximation uh, had not been solved at this stage, which leads us to the next method where instead of using global approximation, the same function for all the data, we use piecewise continuous approximation in the form of quadratic functions where each approximates just part of the range of data, but it is required to merge smoothly with its neighbours. We find this is more flexible and it's much less sensitive to the level of, of approximation. And it never goes dramatically wrong as we saw for polynomial approximation. 
And this is a, a sketch of it that we have our data and our unknowns now are not coefficients in a polynomial, but these so-called not points that we can allocate automatically or, uh, uh, or specify and the mathematics, the program has to work out where the, the, what is the corresponding discharge for these not points. So it, it's actually not very difficult. Let's look at some examples. We look at the Avon River, not where Shakespeare was born, but in the state of Victoria in Australia. And we see this example with a big gap here, which is potentially dangerous. And these methods uh, could be vulnerable to a large gap. In this case, it seemed to work very well. Let's look at the Brahmaputra River in Bangladesh. And this paradoxically, despite being a huge river, and we see here a discharge of 100,000 at the top, uh, uh, it, it's, it's relatively simple. We look at also at the Ganges, also in Bangladesh, the other great river flowing through Bangladesh, and we find a rather different situation where uh, the rating curve seems rather lumpy. There are lumps in it. I've proposed to take them seriously. It would be possible to pass through a rather smoother function, but as a test of both methods of polynomial and splines, we see they can give consistent results. And then there's the Noxubi River here in Alabama, where we, we find it also works well. One thing we now want to look at is short-term changes in the stream can occur as Cray has described, and so things can change quite quickly. The scatter can be incorporated and quantified by the computation of a rating envelope. And so we go through, it's a bit too complicated to describe. Here is a case from Vietnam over three years, but what we can use the methods and described in my papers are that we can cal calculate an envelope to the data so that we can say, uh, we can compute maximum and minimum. Now we want to look at long-term changes where we can also use data approximation and we can weight each data point according to its reliability or weighted by age so that the oldest points have the smallest contributions. And so long-term stream changes can be described and we can construct a rating curve now for any day now or in the past. This is the sort of thing we can get from a, a river in Alabama in the United States. And we can see we get very, very consistent results showing how presumably the bed has dropped. So uh, I've put my sp spline program recently on the web and the program and its operation are described in that PDF document and the program and files are necessary for operation there. But if anybody has a, a question with the program or with a particular site, please write to me. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, John. And um, one of the most uh, often asked questions over the last half hour or so has been, um, will these resources be available? And uh, yeah, we'll take all, I think those references, um, we'll put those up and uh, post those on the website. Um, so yes, definitely, uh, you will have some resources available. Bob, Kyle, uh, if you want to come online again now um, for our Q&A session, thanks, John, for uh, that uh, very concise uh, overview of some very complex problems. Um, I've got to admit that, um, you know, I've, I've been working on rating curves since my university days 30 years ago, and um, just in researching things for this uh, session today, I was blown away at how much research there is out there and how complex a problem this can be. So uh, some of your questions that came across Across the Q&A line, uh, we've been able to answer straight away. Um, others, uh, you know, have have some longer longer answers. Um, let's go to uh, to Bob, uh, I guess, to begin with. Uh, Bob, is there are there questions that you've answered um, that you want to uh, to to highlight here? Uh, okay, there was a question asked about how to measure staging heights, but there was a supplementary question, which was the river is within a built-up area. 
with bridges over its sections, but these bridges are once in a while always submerged. Now, the more general question was the, uh, the person who asked the question basically dealing with a flood-prone area, and the question was how do, uh, what sort of gauge would you put in place? Now, the two answers I've put up were firstly a supplementary question, are you trying to measure stage only or stage and discharge? And basically referred back to some of your comments, Cray, that, that there's a real issue there because measuring water surface elevation on its own, while it's relatively easy, doesn't tell you a great deal if you've got significant changes in the bathymetry with um, with differences in flow rate. You've really got to be careful about uh, uh, where you have uh, uh, significant sediment transport, for example. You've got bed forms moving through the section that you're trying to gauge. At a particular time when you're doing your gauging, is there a dune moving through, which, which may not make a huge difference to the water surface elevation because if the, if the velocity is higher because you're on top of a dune, you get a small change in velocity head, but not necessarily a large change in uh, location of the water surface elevation. But it does give a very significant change in the rating curve itself. So in response to that particular question, what sort of gauge should we be putting in? The answer is another question. What are you actually trying to measure? <laughs> Yeah, and that can be that can vary widely, uh, and I guess we need to differentiate between you know sections of the river that are gauged where you have uh, something going through weir flow or orifice flow or something where you're able to actually predict it without having to guess at the roughness coefficient, and you know you you may have flow monitoring sites where you can uh, just take the stage and turn it directly to discharge um, with some equation. That's very easy. But yeah, if you're in some area where you've got um, you know especially like in a braided system, um, you know. It, it may be very easy to put in a, um, a pressure transducer or something to measure the height or the elevation, but trying to get out there and approximate what the velocities are so that you could do a segmented Q equals VA calc um, can, can be uh, uh, tedious at best. And we need to stress that safety is paramount. People have died trying to collect uh, stream gauge data, especially uh, at high flows when you need it the most. And so we do need to be careful. I remember one time, uh, gauging a stream up in Alaska in the dark uh, with the, my velocity meter and walking back and forth, not realizing that um, as the ice gets submerged by the extreme tides there, eventually it'll break loose. And I had a big ice chunk the size of a VW pop up right next to me um, and just freaked me out. Um, you, you've you've got you've to be, be careful with, uh, with some of the things uh, that we're doing. And I think you're getting better and better methods that are safer and safer um, with some of the Doppler and um, acoustic methods and things like that. So um, Kyle, did you want to address, I think there was a few things you mentioned about geomorphology and some work that you've done in, uh, was it PNG or, or elsewhere. When the system changes, um, when there is significant sediment transport, I know I was doing some work on the Fitzroy River that we saw a couple times here. And um, when I went back to try to take stages and turn them into discharges, there were 18 different calibrated rating curves that had been developed over the last um, you know, couple of decades because of the sediment transport and how much that changes things. Um, did you want to touch on that, Kyle? Yep, and I think that kind of ties into a question here from Martin Fidge. Yep. Um, I saw someone ask before as well, how often should you do um, rating curves in these stage discharge curves? Really, it's ideally as soon as you've found evidence of any erosion and scour or any changes in the catchment behavior. So in PNG, all most of the streams are highly braided, and that's mainly due to the soil condition being just sands and clay. There's very few rock. So continuously, each time a flood event would go through, which would be, you know, multiple times a year, you really should update those gauges. Otherwise, it's a best guess. Um, Martin was mentioning what's the best solution to improve these ratings. And I think um, really depends on how far you want to take it. In modeling, maybe the perfect model is a CFD model, um, considering wind loading, wave run up, debris if it's at a bridge um it's really how long is a piece of string and how much data do you have available um i'd like to see that i'd like to see a rating curve that's been developed by a cfd model wind loading 
if, uh, <laughs> if anyone's interested. Um, yeah, that, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, because wind can make a big difference. It can blow your debris up um, and give you false high water marks and things like that. And um, but key, uh, you know, one of the questions came up: How many data points um, is the minimum necessary to get a reliable rating curve? And again, that's a bit of a loaded question because um, where that happens, um, you know, if you have a whole bunch of data points that are all around some typical daily flow, it's not going to tell you much at all. We need to, if you know, what we're most interested in typically is the low flows and the really high extreme flows, and we typically don't have much data there and extrapolating your rating curve out to those points that's where you can introduce error and that's where a little bit of a reality check you know getting a drone in the air now you know it used to be you have to get up in a helicopter during the flood and see what's going on but getting a drone up in the air or measuring you know making a mark um i, I know at the fitzroy river where we did uh, that that rating you know they went along and um at every single um telephone pole along the uh, this roadway that served as a floodway, somebody went in afterwards and painted the high water mark on there. And we were able to then just go and get a very accurate um, uh, hydraulic model built based on that data. So collecting that would be would be key. Um, John, you want to mention anything? Again, that question came up about how many data points. And my, my, my response was, uh, well, you know, if you're extrapolating, it doesn't matter how many you've got, um, you're still going to have that uncertainty. Um, any 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 uh, anything you wanted to cover there about extrapolating? extrapolating data that's down on the lower part up to the upper part where you don't have any data points. Oh, I, I, I don't like extrapolation at <laughs> all. Uh, it's, uh, and particularly the methods, uh, this is not exactly what you're talking about, but the methods that I'm describing uh, don't allow extrapolation. They would go horribly wrong outside the range of data. Yes. But the, the piecewise continuous spline method uh, is one way of handling data over a large range where you might have large gaps in the middle. It works quite well. Yeah. No, thanks. Um, what we'll do, we've got about five minutes to go here. So I think what we'll do, again, there's been probably 20 or 30 questions here that have come up. Um, we probably won't hit them all, but we'll try to hit most of them, um, maybe in writing, but here verbally to address some of those. Maybe what we'll do is just kind of have some closing remarks and we'll go, uh, let's go in the order, Bob, then Kyle, then John. Um, if you pick one one more question that you see there um, or a question that you, you might, uh, or, or a statement that you might want to make about rating curves, um, let's go ahead and highlight that. And, and then, um, you know, let's have, have your closing remarks and then we'll wrap it up. We've got about five minutes to go. Uh, what, one question, uh, uh, one question asked about the use of Solver, the software in Excel and LibreOffice. And uh, to implement the method that I suggested, Solver is a very good way of doing it. I, uh, I have used uh, my pro my program is written in the C language, but Solver is a very good, uh, simple way of implementing my methods. Okay. Um, oh, and one thing I, I forgot to mention before is that next, uh, I think it's next week, um, we've got uh, WBM coming on, Chris Huxley and others are going to be doing a, a presentation about calibrating your hydraulic model, which is very much related to this topic today. So, you know, we're trying to develop rating curves, but you may want to look at your hydraulic model and say, okay, now I want to take the real data and make my hydraulic model match what the real data is actually doing out there. Um, so join us for that discussion uh, next week. That'll be a very interesting one. Uh, Bob, you want to highlight um, any, any particular questions that uh, you've answered or that you've seen come up here? I, I, I just want to add to one thing that you said, Cray, about the uh, water surface elevation differences across a cross section. And maybe you covered this. I was busy uh, looking at, at the uh, questions at the time. But it's important to recognize, in, in my view, that uh, uh, um, rating gauges are frequently placed in the main channel of a channel floodplain system because that's the only way that you get access to the lower flows, which are all within the channel. But once you get overbank flow, then you have significant lower velocities out on the floodplain than you do in the main channel, depending on the situation. But if you've got that, then the difference in water surface elevation between the main channel uh, and the floodplain very crudely is equal to the difference in the velocity heads, the p squared upon 2g. And again, depending on the circumstances, that can be quite significant. So if you're, if you're working on a, uh, a gauge which is in the main channel, 
and trying to use that to predict what's going to happen uh, under high flow conditions, then you can be right out because you're not even measuring the correct water surface elevation for those high flows. Thanks. Yeah. And, and again, the, the advantages of a 2D model over a 1D or a Manning's equation calculation that's taken at one cross section where you're having to really estimate the energy gradient, you know, um, the, the advantages of a 2D model where you can have varying roughness spatially um, or even depth varying roughness um, accounted for and all the flow directions accounted for. And then like Kyle said, maybe uh, in at some structures, you may want to do a full CFD model um, to, to, to get the rating curve for a particular structure. Uh, any other questions, Kyle, that you wanted to highlight that have come up? Oh, uh, one from Wes here. He said, thanks for the answer. Does the method for the hydraulic analysis change due to the morphological conditions or changes in the channel morphological conditions? I would say no, but if the channel's experiencing, again, lots of erosion scour and there's evidence that there's significant changes, you'd have to increase the frequency. Well, ideally, I would increase the frequency of doing those rating curves. So you probably want to keep the method the same between measurements and updates, but um, increase the frequency. Again. Yeah, and then I think, again, your, your hydraulic model is uh, only as good as your terrain data, and a lot of times LIDAR has missed the bathymetry, and you might need a hydrographic or bathymetric survey to supplement that, and you might need to do that periodically if it's changing, uh, because, again, your hydraulic model, and, and some people I've seen them use. Was, um, uh, go ahead. Yeah, there was a good point from Martin as well, the top of the questions. Um, he was men mentioning often um, less than 50% of the peak is actually captured in a gauge. So it's important to go through, look at the gauges. I think you pulled up an example um, to see if the peak was even captured when you're doing your hydraulic modeling or your calibration. Um, yeah, the points the you need. <laughs> yeah, the, the points you need the most are the high flows, and that's when your gauges tend to, uh, tend to fail. Um, but don't. Uh, and and then I think we mentioned last week on a webinar too. Some people um, mentioned using SRTM data for your terrain data. Don't. That's not going to help you for uh, anything shot from space. Um, is not going to help you uh, for your stream gauging. So we need to uh, get get up there with a the drone, get some good lidar data, um, go out and do some measurements. This will get you out in the field and 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 calibrating these things. John, any uh, closing remarks? I think we're about out of time, but uh, any closing remarks? Thanks for coming on. No, uh, several people have asked about scattered data and looped rating curves. Well, um, the the uh, c computing the envelope is a first approximation that one might consider. It's a, it's a, a possibly interesting way of doing it, not for an individual event, but for uh, a number of points that one might have. Thanks. All right. No, I think there's still a few questions uh, to go here, but what we'll do, we'll paste all these resources into some supplementary documents that we'll pass along. Um, thanks uh, so much, uh, John and Bob and Kyle, for attending and presenting and taking your time to do this. Um, and I hope, uh, you know, we appreciate it. these are free webinars and we are, uh, you know, we have volunteers here uh, on staff giving you this information to the industry. So I do sincerely appreciate your time for that. Um, this is something that's available for free, but if you do want to get into more detail, please do sign up for some of the courses. Uh, do not exit uh, without clicking that button that says fill out the survey. We would like to hear from all of you. Um, you'll see uh, a list of some of the courses coming up. Um, what comes up after these courses is up to you. Um, what you are suggesting to us now will turn into our future courses a few months from now. So um, do give us that feedback. So with that, um, thanks for your attendance today. Uh, thanks, John, Kyle, and Bob for your uh, skills, your professionalism, and your the details that you've provided us with today. I um, hope to work together with you on some of these uh, webinars and courses going forward. So with that, we'll say goodbye and uh, thanks. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Subscribe by clicking the link below and click on the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases. For the latest in significant, innovative and critical advances in water science, technology and management, subscribe now. To build your skills, enhance your technical knowledge and learn from leading experts in water, visit theaustralianwaterschool.com.au and discover our online training courses, both live and on demand.